Remember when Netflix announced their plan to do original content back in 2013? Oh man, they got the creator of Weeds to do a comedy about women in prison? They got the director of Alien 3 to do a TV show about corrupt politicians? They got the, uh, the hostile guy to produce like a weird, violent werewolf show? Never mind, let's forget about that one. It was a huge deal. In a world of old, stubborn media empires wildly flailing their arms in confusion amidst the sudden desire for instant streaming access, many of whom are still flailing, here was an ambitious upstart unbeholden to advertisers or Nielsen ratings, no broadcast decency laws to contend with, and a platform with virtually unlimited potential access across the globe. They were free to greenlight the kinds of shows you didn't see anywhere else. Weird niche genre stories with high stylization and a unique identity. Netflix didn't care if these shows were advertiser friendly or even if anybody watched them, really. The only thing Netflix had to sell was Netflix, and just having high quality award winning content did exactly that. And boy, did they greenlight some wild stuff. <laughs> What network in their right mind would ever have produced A Series of Unfortunate Events, Lady Dynamite, or BoJack Horseman without forcing some serious changes? Then you have Sense8, a globe-spanning adventure about eight random people who wake up one day with their minds linked, whose budget ballooned to $9 million an episode by its second season. Then there's The Get Down, Boz Lerman's weird interpretation of 1970s hip-hop culture as informed by Hip Hop Family Tree, which cost roughly $120 million. Where else but Netflix could shows so ambitious and strange find that kind of funding? Oh, they they canceled Sensei and the Get Down. They, they canceled Lady Dynamite. They canceled Marco Polo and Hemlock Grove and Bloodline. So much for that. Now, okay, Netflix is a public company with their own profit motives, and they obviously have the right to cancel whatever the heck they want. They don't have infinite money yet. And ultimately, this is still a business. If a show isn't getting eyes and it's costing them millions of dollars to produce, it makes sense to throw it under the bus. But we already have a bit of a contradiction here, don't we? Here's a Netflix investor call from 2014 that says, Because each show on Netflix is not competing for scarce primetime slots like on linear TV, a show that is taking a long time to find its audience is one we can keep nurturing. Now, I don't want to read any grand authorial intent into these words because Netflix isn't a group of rowdy directors laying out the Dogma 95 doctrine out of passion. They're a corporation trying to sell a fabricated image of themselves to potential investors. But this idea of nurturing a show's audience is, I think, a huge part of what made Netflix seem so revolutionary. House of Cards didn't appeal to the same audience as Orange is the New Black. It's unlikely that fans of Castlevania would enjoy Glow. But that didn't matter because under the surface of the Netflix UI lived a web of algorithms studying user behavior. Ah, we see you enjoyed both Sleepless in Seattle and Hellraiser 4. Other people who enjoyed those two movies also liked The Cat in the Hat. Oh yeah! All this means that they're not just shilling the same five things everyone's already seen, they're attempting to nurture an ecosystem that points relevant content to those who want to see it. The idea is not to create a platform that is homogenous, but that feels tailored to each individual user. This is what allowed Netflix to feel like more than just a random library of movies. Did you ever go into a blockbuster and just feel paralyzed? I don't know about you, but I almost always went with the stuff that was on the employee favorites shelf or whatever the newest Hollywood release was because it felt like less of a risk. Netflix by no means eliminated the crisis of too much choice, but they made it feel more curated than the alternative, as though you walked into a blockbuster with the same number of movies, but the employees knew you specifically were coming in that day and based the visible selection on what they thought you might like. That's, uh, that's actually kind of horrifying if you put it that way. But something seems to have changed in recent years. My recommendations don't really feel all that personal. In point of fact, they're basically just whatever the most recent buzzworthy Netflix original is. Ah, you liked the final season of The Fall? Killed in your own homes by strangulation. May we humbly suggest... Bright? Fairy lives don't matter today. Uh, pl please? Please, please, please watch Bright.
please. There was a time when Netflix original felt like a distinguishing title to me. Regardless of actual quality, it meant the original in question had a unique flavor that set it apart from something you'd see on a traditional network. I mean, I didn't like Hemlock Grove, but it's kind of amazing that it even exists at all. I used to make a point of watching all the Netflix originals because I knew at the very least they were going to give me something I didn't expect. But as is always the case, a successful public entity desires only to become more successful. So Netflix and increased their production and acquisition budget year over year over year until it now sits at over 13 billion dollars in March of 2018 alone. 54 Netflix originals made their debut. 50, 54? 54? Is that, that can't be right. Hold on. Wow, yeah, no, that's right. That's correct. Jesus. 54, 54? Why? How? What? When Netflix began, nobody really knew the value of streaming rights. They could afford to have a handful of Netflix originals as a sort of cherry on top of their library of existing material. But with their success came the rise of competitors and the likes of Hulu and Amazon Prime, and it wasn't long before networks themselves realized the obvious earnings potential of a streaming service of their own. So they all started buying their streaming rights back and tried to make their own services, except you still need a cable subscription, which entirely defeats the point. It took HBO until 2015 five years into Game of Thrones before they created a streaming service that didn't require a separate cable subscription. Ugh, why do so many people pirate our show? This generation is so morally bankrupt. They just want all of their entertainment for free. Most people actually do want to pay for your stupid stuff. They just don't want to pay upwards of $60 a month for a garbage cable service they'll never use just to watch the one show of yours they really care about. Look at you, Cartoon Network. I took my bank account into a wormhole that fed directly into Rebecca Sugar's pocket if you let me. You know, the best I can do to watch a new Steven Universe is download your stupid app just to watch it on my phone! Also, how are you gonna finally release the first season of Steven Universe on home media after three years, but it's only on DVD? This is 2018, Cartoon Network. I just want to give you my money. God, get your shit together! So as a result, Netflix's total library decreased by over 50% by 2016. This meant they had to lean hard into their originals to maintain the image of a deep catalog. I mean, it'd be disastrous if somebody could just, like, finish Netflix. Netflix. So besides signing buzzworthy exclusives like Adam Sandler movies, Dave Chappelle specials, and uh, Bright. Do not wink at me like that. It's incumbent upon them to get their grubby little hands on everything they can find that has an iota of legitimacy because quantity makes them look competitive and Netflix original as a brand has particular distinction. But the flip side to this is that with so many Netflix originals, the title of Netflix original has all but lost that distinction. Everything is a Netflix original now. And this ties into the larger problem of peak TV, the idea that there's just too much coming out for most people to keep up with. Now you might be thinking, what's wrong with more? Don't we want more artists making more things? Doesn't Netflix's haphazard acquisition strategy create the opportunity for more diverse, less experienced creators to get their weird ideas off the ground? And the answer is yes, but. How does Netflix advertise their originals? They obviously make trailers, they buy banner ads on sites using programmatic advertising. But really, where did you first hear about Stranger Things or Mindhunter? Was it a banner ad that caught your eye? Did you stumble upon the trailer at random? Now chances are, you saw a piece on it at Polygon or io9, or it was trending on Reddit, or your friends were talking about it. And to be fair, this is probably how you found out about most of the things you like. We naturally have a sort of tribal mistrust of anything that doesn't come with some external promise of quality. Someone you trust insists it's good, it comes from a creator you enjoy, or it's released on a platform with a good track record. For all the billions upon billions of dollars that companies spend on advertising, the most effective marketing is still word of mouth. Black Panther isn't the highest grossing superhero movie ever because Marvel bought a few billboard ads. It's because people were hyped that we finally got a proudly black story with an essentially all-black cast directed by a black man, all of which are things that Marvel made sure were emphasized in press events. And it also helps that the movie is pretty good. Netflix is what it is because of word of mouth, which is great. 
They don't feel like a faceless corporate entity, they feel like a cool workshop you visit sometimes to see all the weird new contraptions they're thinking of. Where this starts to break down, though, is when Netflix's model shifts away from releasing a few curated originals a year to pumping out dozens of originals every month. Wow, your coworker says. Have you seen Mindhunter? No, you reply, but I sure want to. So you go home and you watch, like, an episode. And then you go to work again and you say, I watched an episode of Mindhunter. And your coworker replies, oh, cool, how did you feel when Cat Captain Fluffy Ruffles died. Or wait, has that happened yet? I can't remember. Uh, okay, let's just let's just wait until you finish the show to talk about it. The fuel of word of mouth is our jealousy at being unable to contribute to a conversation, our desire to have some substantial role in an in-group. No one wants to be the one person not talking about Stranger Things when everyone is talking about Stranger Things. But these conversations are time sensitive, lasting just a few months if you're lucky. So okay, you as a viewer want to get caught up on the latest show and take part in that conversation conversation while it's still trendy. In the past, this hype flared up within the first couple episodes of the season's premiere, and you'd have, you know, a week to catch up on reruns or find it on a streaming service. Today, the conversation necessarily begins on day one with a requisite viewing of the entire season. And with a new show happening every week, if you're even a little bit slow in your viewing habits, or you have any kind of social life, or you have a job, or you're trying to finish school, by the time you've caught up, everyone else has moved on to the next thing. It's hard to measure the zeitgeist empirically, but Google search trends give at least some indication of what's on people's minds. Let's look at the last five years of Google searches for a couple shows. First, here's House of Cards. Buzz is low, but then there's a sudden uptick when the season releases, followed by a pretty equal downtick over the course of about a month. We see the same thing with Orange is the New Black. Next to nothing, sudden astronomical rise, fast descent, backed to preseason levels. Here are those two graphs laid over top one another. Now, here's Game of Thrones. There's a similar trend in that we started a baseline interest, followed by a rise at the season premiere, followed by a downtick after the finale. The difference is that the peak sustains itself for a solid three months covering the season's 10-week run. We see the same basic thing with The Walking Dead, but their peaks last even longer because they split their seasons so that they air over a longer stretch of time. Here they are overlaid. So. Let's put it all together. When we take Game of Thrones out for clarity, this is what we see. House of Cards and Orange is the New Black are two of Netflix's most popular and talked about shows. They're marquee originals that prove to the world that they could do original content. But not only is The Walking Dead a popular search term for a lot longer on average, even in between seasons, it maintains a solid 12% of its peak. It's definitely not fair to hold up two of the most successful shows on television as examples of the norm, and there's only so much we can fur from Google searches. But the trend is still pretty clear. Temporal distance creates psychological presence. When you have to wait a week or more to find out what happens next, you want to talk about it. And media sites want to cash in on that, so they write speculation blogs and publish all the latest gossip. The Walking Dead itself is only one piece of the larger puzzle that is audience engagement. Its release strategy is just as responsible for its popularity as the actual content of the show. Comparatively, 12 hours of a fantastic series released released in a day with no promise of more for at least a full calendar year, leaves virtually no room for theories or speculation. No distance means no presence. It's here, it's over, and then it's gone. So there was a time when Netflix claimed that traditional metrics of popularity didn't matter and that they could afford to nurture a show. In that investor call that I cited earlier, they also said this, we are able to provide a platform for more creative storytelling, varying runtimes per episode based on storyline, no need for week to week recaps, and no fixed notion of what constitutes a season. And that's great. That's Exciting, except every episode is around an hour long, every season is around 13 episodes, and every season drops all at once. The hypothetical freedom of the format has crystallized into its own tradition, despite plenty of shows not needing that length. Lately, it seems that many originals suffer from a sort of Netflix flu. The first couple episodes of a season are at least pretty good, and then things get slow and meandering, kind of drowsy. And then there's a shakeup around episode 9, things pick up again, and then you've got about a 50-50 chance as to whether the finale sucks eggs. I have to imagine that at least some of this reliable droopiness is the result of Netflix's model. When you don't have to work around the structure of act breaks for commercials, when you don't have to make an episode feel like a complete story, when you don't have to juggle decency standards and network notes, you're left with a freedom that can actually be kind of stifling. On top of that, when you know that every episode is going to be out on the same day and you know that most people are just going to watch the entire thing in an afternoon, 
You don't even really have to make sure that each individual episode is that good. Some creators have managed to use this freedom to their advantage. I think a series of unfortunate events does a stellar job of using Netflix's model as a way to craft an entire season simultaneously such that everything feels balanced and considered and ultimately adds up. But the fact is this model just doesn't suit every writer. Plenty of people need constraints, especially in an industry where most creators will have cut their teeth in a system that constrains them heavily. Despite this, and despite Netflix's own insistence that their platform allows them to experiment with the very genetic source code of the television format, writers are still forced to tell 10 to 13 episodes of a story regardless of whether that's truly what the story needs. So let's return to Sensei. This is one of Netflix's most expensive shows, created by two of Hollywood's best-known directors with a diverse cast and location spanning almost every continent on Earth. If there were any show that warranted experimentation, it was this one. And yet, Netflix still relied on word of mouth as their primary marketing vehicle, and its seasons are still 12 episodes long. The thing about Sensei is, it's a weird show. It's exactly the kind of thing that only Netflix would produce. It's hard to describe, it takes a while to get off the ground, and it can be exhausting. Netflix's word of mouth strategy just doesn't work here. It's not pithy enough to go viral overnight, it's too wild to really become a sensational icon. If any show needs to be nurtured, it's Sensate. We need a different strategy to make Sensate successful. One thing to change would be the number of episodes per season and the length of those episodes. Sensei always has a lot going on, and going to everybody at least once an episode can make you feel a little bit like you've run a marathon. Let's imagine instead that each season ran maybe five or six episodes of about 90 minutes each. This could have afforded them enough time to give each Sensei their own satisfying mini arc without giving the viewer whiplash. On top of that, what if a new episode came out, say, every two weeks? Let's say Netflix treats Sensei like this big event. First episode comes out, the Wachowskis and the actors have time to talk about the show and all the exciting things to come. The people who watched it have time to tell their friends, and their friends have time to actually watch the episode so that they can be part of the rest of the conversation as it happens, which then gives them a sense of ownership because they were there, man! That ownership doesn't just make for people who watched Sense8, that makes for Sense8 fans. And those are the people who will keep the conversation going for years. Something like Stranger Things has just the right mix of elements to strike a nerve and become an iconic word-of-mouth sensation. But Sensei just isn't that. It needed temporal distance to allow viewers to digest it piece by piece, and it could have thrived with a community of theorists and speculators all trying to figure out the mysteries of its world. This is what nurturing a show looks like. This is what the freedom of streaming looks like. It's not enough to just greenlight interesting original shows, you also have to figure out what those shows need. How many episodes? How long is each episode? How should they be released? It's impossible to know if, in this hypothetical reality, such a strategy would have changed the fate of Sense8. It may be the case that it was just too off-putting at a glance to get a cultural foothold. Whatever the case, though, the fact that Netflix didn't even try shaking things up really lays bare their hypocrisy. They want to be something new and groundbreaking and disruptive to cultivate an image of auteurship and quality, but they also want to give someone everything they'd expect from cable and more, and the only way to do that is to imitate the old guard as much as possible. Play with content all you want, but too much tinkering with the format? makes people uncomfortable. So really, Netflix isn't all that different from what came before. For all their talk of revolution, curation, and nurture, they're really just another private media company, just with a coat of red paint and a high-speed internet connection. Here at the end, I'm reminded of a video fellow YouTuber Viheart did some years ago, talking about how artists cultivate audiences. There is a widely accepted misconception that media merely serve as neutral packages for the dissemination of raw facts. Photographers once thought that by getting their photographs published in life, they would thereby reach large audiences. Gradually, they discovered that the only message that came through was Life Magazine itself, and that their pictures had become but bits and pieces of that message. Let's return to those Google Trends graphs for a moment. Here's five years of searches for Orange is the New Black. Here's House of Cards. And here's Netflix. The only thing Netflix has to sell is Netflix. The medium is quite literally the message. Special thanks go to Logan McQuiston, 
Richard Daly, Austin McCauley, and Amy Mims. These are just four of my lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash LTAS, where you can pledge as little as a dollar a month to support me making more videos like this one. I also host the Trans Questioning Podcast, where I try to figure out what it means to be transgender. Links to music articles and other sources are in the description of this video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you again in the near-ish future. Next video is going to be Twin Peaks, Episode 1, Act 2. It's going to be weird. <laughs> Why are these horses wearing suits?